Cancerous Conference, Day 1, Talk 2, Stephen Engstrom. No, no, I knew that was going to but I know Brad had actually written it. So, it would have been nice to review the note and not so necessary. He's got the, the one to self-understanding of his reason with us uh, in the form of knowledge and its object, concerning and account. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I, um, I'm hoping you'll share some of your understanding with me today. Um, I was just going over this piece um, uh, and today and um, um, my head's been out of it for a while um, and I find 
but rather um, disconcerting to read it from far and discover how obscure the second section is in particular with other parts as well perhaps. Um, so um, I'll be welcoming any help I can get from you. Um, um, I'll also um, apologize in advance for um, offering a paper for this uh, conference which um, doesn't engage um, philosophy of local sellers in any discernible way. Um, or if someone can discern it, they'll have to tell me about it. Um, um, I, um, Rod mentioned the summer two ago that he knew of Kant by like hearsay. Um, I think it's somewhat the same relation to Seller. Being from Pittsburgh, I hear a lot of say. So there we are. Um, so I think um, I'll um, I'll follow um, uh, Thomas's. Um, lead and um, just say a very brief word about how this paper arose and you know, something in the way of background and then um, uh, let, let, let things kind of move to discussion. I, for many years, uh, worked on Kant's theoretical philosophy. Um, um, as is my want, I tend to focus on the parts that well, were interesting, and also I thought I had some prospect of understanding, and that meant reserving other parts um, for later attention. And one of the parts that I tended to just leave aside, not knowing what to do with, uh, was the um, part that made the theme of this paper, the Copernican idea of um, the relation that our knowledge bears to its object. Um, and I've noticed, too, um, over the years that it doesn't itself receive a whole lot of attention from the um, commentators and those who dis discuss Kant's theoretical philosophy uh, tends to be on the margins the um, doctrine of transcendental idealism gets a lot more attention um, although the two aspects of Kant seem to be related um, and I over time gradually you know, came to think well if I think there's something in Kant's theoretical philosophy that's um, worthwhile and gives point to the time I spend on it, um, something is going to need to be, um, I need to do something about this um, question of how to understand the um, uh, Kant's characterization of the, of the relation of knowledge to its object that he will be supposing or um, working in accordance with in, in, the, in the first critique. And so I began um, this probably a couple of decades ago and I just began, to, I began to think about it a little and over time I began to warm to it in a certain way and that's a process that's still going on. Um, you can see from the document that I'm not all the way there yet, but, um, <laughs> but um, um, uh, that's how this came to be written. So, um, if you, those of you who have had a chance to read it will note I'm trying to start um, with a reflection upon um, ordinary theoretical cognition. When Kant commonly distinguishes the, the scientific um, mode in which theoretical cognition or intuition can develop, distinguishes that from the ordinary human understandings, theoretical cognition. And um, for reasons I mentioned in the, in the document, it seems as though if we're going to make sense of Kant's Copernican way of thinking, given that he is introducing it as uh, a component in a critique of a long tradition of metaphysics, um, um, it had better be the case that uh, we can find this understanding of cognition in relation to its object in the primordial or primitive self-understanding of theoretical cognition prior to science. Um, we need to be able to reflect self-consciously on the activity of theoretical knowing and recover an understanding of this relation. Uh, it seems to me that if that can't be done, um, 
it's going to be very difficult to understand how a project like a critique of your reason can be carried out. And it is going to shape the tone at all today. So, anyway, that's the, um, here's, here's uh, the attempt, or the first attempt. So, we not really that. Um, I have three questions concerning your characterization of the self-consciousness of cognition. The first is that it often sounds as if um, the fact that cognition is self-consciousness, self-conscious consists in the fact that the cognizing subject understands what cognition is. And but and when you when you say that cognition is self-conscious, you refer the reader to the paragraph 16 of the deduction. And there, I mean, there Kant only says that the I think has to accompany every representation that is something for the subject. And that seems, I mean, seems something different to say that the I think has to accompany the representation than saying that the subject has to have an understanding of what the representation is. But the second way is the way you have to understand it. Mm -hmm. Shall I pose the other two questions? Or? Oh, okay. um, well, let me just say yeah. a word about that. Um, um, it's true that the, um, the, the, the characterization of um, self-consciousness in Section 16 is um, not obviously as, as rich as the, um, the characterization that I'm developing in this paper. Um, but I, I'm draw, I think I, I'm drawing on more in the um, Kant's writings than, than just that passage, although I don't do maybe the best job of indicating mm -hmm. what all. But there are a number of things, for example, in the, uh, in the chapter on the paralogisms, uh, paralogism of pure reason, which Kant um, um, suggests, I think, that um, the self-consciousness that's registered in his uh, he, he marks the phrase, I think, uh, is um, the, the sole text of the whole science of rational psychology. <coughs> it that science. It seems also to allow that there's a, um, a legitimate kind of self-understanding that is being confused with, this, with, with a theoretical science. And so if you... Um, I think strong on the discussion of self-consciousness that comes out of the paralysis and you find something rather richer. And there are other okay. things in this mm -hmm. And there are also just things, it seems to me, that we can say um, from our understanding of what we're thinking or, or judging about our thinking or judging uh, without needing to um, engage in something like a theoretical inquiry into what we're doing. Um, which seemed to me to be very much in the spirit of what Kant takes uh, himself to be engaging in in the particular degrees. He calls the work a project of self-knowledge. And that, of course, raises the question in the mind of the readers what kind of knowledge he has in mind there. Um, is it kind of theoretical self-knowledge, or is it empirical, or is it somehow metaphysical in, 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 in a way that's um, problematic? Um, what is the metaphysics Kant criticizes the problem of by his life? So, um, I think that he's using knowledge there in a <coughs> broader sense than he uses it when he's talking about just theoretical knowledge. Um, and so we can, I think, include the awareness of self, the self awareness that's you know, articulated under the heading of self conscious as a kind of knowledge, or kindness, anyway. Um, if we appreciate that the term can be used in different ways. Mm -hmm. Kant, you know, Kant thinks of philosophy as a science, a, a systematic body of scientific knowledge which has a formal part, logic, a material part, which has two further parts, theoretical and practical. And the logic he calls formal science. Uh, not theoretical, not practical. Uh, it seems to be the kind of science in his understanding of it that's um, <coughs> um, resides in self consciousness. So, so it's, it's these other, these yeah. other okay. aspects. Yeah, in, in the paper you just 
you just refer to paragraph 16. Yeah. I thought that's maybe not, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So maybe then my second question, I will just pose it and then you, maybe you can answer it in a similar way. The second question is related very much to, par to page 11 and 12 in your paper, where you start by saying that cognition is self-conscious, and there you refer to B131, so the beginning of paragraph 16, and from this you infer that cognition or knowledge is a unity, and from this on paragraph 12 you infer that it's an activity, and from this you infer that it has a certain determinacy, and from this you infer that it's self-sustaining, and, from, and then you say, and as self-sustaining or self-productive, it, it is distinguished from bare thinking. But then I thought something, that there seems to be a problem because in the beginning of paragraph 16, Kant just says that the I think can accompany, uh, or has to, it has to be possible that the I think accompanies every, represent, every representation that is something for me, and that could also be a thought. So if you just refer to the beginning of par to the self-consciousness that Kant is talking about in paragraph 16, <coughs> then it's very strange that you end by, from talking about this kind of self-consciousness, to end by a characterization by which cognition is distinguished from thinking when the kind of self-consciousness Kant talks about is a self-consciousness that refers to cognition and also thought. Yeah. Um, um, right. Let, let's go. Let's go back to the um, the first sentence of section 16. Um, I take it that when Kant <coughs> uses that expression, he um, is signaling to his audience that he has in mind the Cartesian proposition, cogito. Um, in the paralogism chapter, I think that becomes pretty clear. Um, so I'm thinking of the, um, the um, that first proposition in section 16 as um, referring to <coughs> an act, which is an act of Cognition. Perhaps that we can hear it in a broader sense than um, um, so that it includes your thinking as well as the determinant sort of thinking that constitutes cognition, and theoretical cognition. Um, thinking, as Kant uses it, if I understand, it's my understanding that when Kant introduces the, the notion of thinking, he has in mind in the first instance, um, he means in the first instance to characterize our form of cognition as distinct from, say, infinite cognition. It's a way of registering the finitude of our cognition. I have in mind, perhaps especially the, um, the introduction, that long, hairy paragraph that leads us to the table of the functions of thinking and judgment, the metaphysical deduction, where he, um, he speaks of the understanding there as initial, that hasn't been uh, characterized only negatively up to that point, the nonsense of the fact that we have something like that. And, um, and then he goes on to um, describe it as um, uh, in terms of thinking, not intuitive, discursive, not intuitive. So thinking seems to be um, a term that in, in his hands that in the first instance serves to mark the conceptual um, discursive character of our form of knowing. So he'll say, you know, our knowledge is thinking, not intuitive. Um, now it comes with um, the capacity to know by thinking that it's also possible to exercise such a capacity in bare thinking. Um, the way in which we mark the difference between a synthetic judgment and an analytic judgment is through the possibility of thinking the logical contradictory of a synthetic judgment. 
whereas in the case of an analytic judgment, <coughs> there is no logical point of view available to be thought. So <coughs> we need to have the capacity to merely think something um, if we're to have the capacity to judge synthetically, recognizing the difference between that and an analytic judgment. So fair thinking will come along with the, um, with the capacity to know by thinking. Um, now that, um, I'm not sure whether that's quite speaking to maybe all the sources of concern that might be very <coughs> reflected in your question, but that's a first reply, and you can tell me whether it's pointing in the right direction or not. I think uh, I, not I, didn't, I didn't understand completely why that's an answer. Um, I, I may not, not not have got it, but um, I thought I heard you uh, doing something like accusing Steve of squeezing all of that that's in that paragraph that you pointed to uh, out of, I might say, the bare idea of self-consciousness. Um, uh, mm-hmm. con- uh, uh, bare thinking is self-conscious, essentially self-conscious. Yes. But you're not in the business of saying... Um, uh, any old thing that's essentially self-consciousness um, about such uh, um, we, we can squeeze out of it self-consciousness uh, all of those things that Stephanie was I mean it, it's, it's the self-consciousness of knowledge as knowledge yes that's right um, I don't know that makes it much cruder than, than maybe you want um, uh, if, if that was your, your question then I think what Steve said did answer it I mean, I'm thinking that um, it's a kind of ge- uh, genus of thinking, mm-hmm. and everything that will be of interest to us will fall under thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, discursive knowing is a kind of thinking. Whether um, there's also bare thinking, which is not <coughs> cognizing or knowing, um, but that doesn't mean that knowing isn't just as much thinking as bare thinking. Is thinking. So, yeah, that's fine. Into, that, so, that's as far as sure. self-consciousness is integral to thinking at all, it will be integral to everything that counts as thinking, every specification. I just meant that you seem to say that what, from what Kant says in the beginning of paragraph 16, you can infer that cognition in some way is distinguished from mere thinking, even though in the beginning of paragraph 16, Kant, when Kant talks about self-consciousness, he doesn't talk about spe- specifically <coughs> the self-consciousness of cognition, but generally the self-consciousness of all representations, so cognition and thought. So it seems strange that you are able <coughs> to infer something that dis- differentiates cognition from thought. Um, I, I think that this is a reflection of maybe my make moving too quickly through that paragraph. I, I, I don't think I mean to dispute that. Um, I, I know I don't mean to dispute that um, uh, in taking a step from thinking in its self awareness and <coughs> consciousness to knowing and uh, what. Um, we're in a position to say about knowing through its self-consciousness that um, further determinacy is being introduced and, I, and I'm um, uh, just sort of setting out what I take to be um, um, involved in the self-consciousness of knowing that distinguishes it from from fair thinking if I'm, if I'm, if I'm I'm going to go on the right page here. So, um, um, my, my thought is that un- thinking um, <coughs> can specify itself into various further thoughtful activities, mm-hmm. and every one of these specifications, because they're specifications of the self conscious activity of thinking, must be self-consciously constituted as the specific modes of thinking or forms of thinking that they are. So self-consciousness will be carried through, and with each step in which we determine or specify the kind of activity we're engaged in, um, we're 
not just having something happen to us. We're doing it understandingly or, 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 or in, a, in, a, in an awareful way, <laughs> put it that way. Um, in, in, in judging, um, which is a form in which cogn- cognition, um, the form of cognition for a finite knower, um, we understand that we're not merely thinking, we're merely entertaining, we're merely supposing. Uh, we don't need to wait and be told that or to, uh, to engage in some kind of theoretical inquiry to understand, to know that we're judging how things are and not just thinking how they might be or supposing things in a certain way. So um, that's the thought is that's got to go all the way down um, um, if we you know, <coughs> distinguish further between the sort of knowing that's really theoretical or the sort of practical this will be again a self-consciously drawn <coughs> distinction. So I start at what I think to be the highest point, um, where the self-consciousness tweaks and attaches originally. And I take it that's maybe has something to do with why Kant starts. <laughs> so let's make a distinction between a question and a follow-up. Thomas, was yours question? That was a question, and yours is a follow-up. Okay, yes. Okay. So we'll go to Matt. Well, sir, I, I just uh, maybe a way of putting Stephanie's question that uh, makes it more open-ended is: Could you talk about how much you can squeeze out the property of self-consciousness? I mean, it looks in this paragraph on page eleven that I think was she was thinking of, right? It, I'm toward the bottom of the page. Right. The self-consciousness essential to knowledge in general entails that knowledge is no mere aggregate. That could be read two ways. Either it could be read as the self-consciousness essential to knowledge uh, entails no, no mere aggregate, or it could be read as the self-consciousness essential to knowledge right, entails that it's no mere aggregate. It looks as you go on as though it's meant to be the former. Uh, since self-consciousness is identical with that of which it's conscious, whereas the elements of an aggregate are wholly distinct, Nothing can be conscious of itself as a mere aggregate. Um, and then the properties of knowledge look as though they uh, has to be in agreement with itself, re- self-reinforcing, etc. It looks as though they come out of a thought about what any self-consciousness must be. Okay, good. I mean, if that's not right, yeah, that's then... That's what I think, yeah. That's what I think. Well, sorry, okay. So, so, so here was the concern, right? The, the, the concern was there are acts of self-conscious representation that are not knowing, um, right? For instance, thinking. Right. Um, uh, what's true of any act of self, that's self-conscious must be true of them, too. Uh, so if these are properties special to knowledge, uh, they can't in, be entailed sheerly by the fact that it's an act of self-conscious representation. So, 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 how do I hold these thoughts together? Steve, Steve can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> he says you can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Make it worse. <laughs> 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 Possible to actual. <laughs> yeah. Um. This um. Yeah, um, I, there's a progress here, um, and you're, you're noticing a step I'm taking without making it clear enough, I think, that I'm making it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I want, I'm, uh, I'm moving fairly quickly in this, in this, in this paper from the idea of unity to the um, um, what I'm calling um, unity that has a positive character. So I've got a generic notion of unity which um, I'm taking to be um, um, constitutive of all thinking. And then there's a, a um, positive unity as I'm calling it which is specific to cognition. And the um, the way I try um, it's <coughs> the unity I have in mind, generically speaking, now is the unity that we find in a thought, uh, which will involve a variety, more multiplicity of concepts brought together um, into one one mm-hmm. thought. 
Um, so although there is diversity in the representation, I have an understanding of the subject, let's say, um, in the case of a subject predicate thought, mm -hmm. um, I have an understanding of the predicate, and my understanding of each is distinct from my understanding of the other, mm -hmm. but I also am using these concepts in a relation to one another in such a way that the two acts, the two uses of the, of the concepts, are joined in a single act of understanding mm -hmm. the, um, the constitutes of thought in which the two concepts figure. Yeah. So there's a unity that um, um, I'm asserting, I guess, um, characteristic of the um, recognizable through the self-conscious thinking, generally. The positive unity that I um, go on very quickly to talk about and focus on is the unity that distinguishes the kind of combination of concepts that constitute a judgment from the combination of concepts and figures in the mere thought. Mm -hmm. So judgment is a thought, judging is thinking, so that same unity is there, again, in the judging, but there's something more involved in that, in the, in the unity in the, of the concepts in the judgment. And that something more is, um, well, it's this, it's this thing that philosophers struggle to try to, uh, to articulate. It's what, you know, what is assertion. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that moment of assertion um, that, um, uh, as Kant would put it, that's just characteristic of, of judging. And I have... Um, tried, um, I, I don't say too much about it here, but I, I, I've tried elsewhere to um, explicate it or give a partial account of it by speaking of the way in which when I judge, um, in judging, the act holds itself in the intellect, or it, it mm -hmm. sustain, has a kind of staying power, as I put it here, it sustains itself. In the case of a thought, a mere thought, that's not present. The thought um, there's nothing intrinsic to the thought that um, give, that enables it to carry forward, even though it has this, it's a very curious kind of unity. That it needs something to hold it in place. Um, it needs maybe something, um, it might be something aesthetic, um, something about the thought that pleases me, and I might hold my, I might hold my attention for that reason. So a thought can you know, endure in, in, in one's in one's mind over, over a stretch of time, but it's, there's nothing, it doesn't have the intrinsic sort of um, um, durability of, 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 of an <coughs> that, that's, a, that's, is that? No, that's helpful. I mean, you're right. The question was how much comes from subconsciousness purely. And all we get is bare unity. Yeah. The, 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 the not yet positive unity. <laughs> Uh, is this follow yeah, yeah. Would it be more, more correct to say that there is something less in thinking than in judgment? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's something. Something. The more. The more uh, I mean, there's are like the relation between supposition understood as some bracketing of assertion, so to speak. So to suppose something is well, to get something out of assertion. Oh, oh, you're thinking, I see, you're thinking of um, um, uh, supposing or mere thinking as something... No, like for example, one kind of thinking will be... Yeah, 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 okay. Be, be a yeah, yeah, a yeah exactly, exactly, like that. exactly. That's true, and I would have to think of that as kind of a, a further... I see. Yeah, um, yeah. Mere thinking just has the positive, or the, 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 the non-positive form of unity. Assertion has a positive form, and under certain conditions one might for perhaps cognitively respectable reasons or not, um, try to withhold one's, one's readiness no. to assert um, mm. in respect of a particular con um, yeah, concept. That's, that's, that's a good point. Yes. Um, two short, really short follow-ups on, on, on that issue. So, um, on your answer to Matt. Okay. So, one um, concerns the unity of judgment and the unity of the concept. So I wonder if you want to restrict this kind of self-sustaining unity only to judgment 
or to suggest that this is the unity of concept too, given that Kant, for example, claims in one famous paragraph that you know, the function that brings unity into um, judgments is the same function that brings unity into intuition. So just how you think about the differences and similarities between the unity of the judgment and the unity of concept in this regard. And the second one is, um, I wonder if thinking about the unity particular to judgment, but not to bare thinking, as self-sustaining already points to something like a temporal dimension that is built into judgment. Or, con- or our little finite cognition. Um. Okay. Um, let, me, let, let me address the second of those first. Um, I help myself to temporal um, terminology when I was when I was explaining in quantum math what was distinctive of um, judging as opposed to mere thinking, the quality of unity has. Um, um, and I think it can be helpful to just help to helpful to direct attention to what I have in mind by doing that. But I um, I share your what I take to be your um, what's behind your question that in the first instance it shouldn't be in temporal terms that we characterize the positive unity of judgment. So I I I think this happens in this paper. Um, I I prefer to speak of the positive unity in terms of a, of the self agreement um, that we find in the in the um, in the thought a kind of um, agreement so far as there are, there are component elements in the in the unity, um, an agreement among them such that um, if you want to think about it in terms of in temporal terms, it will sustain itself across um, an integral time. But, but um, um, I also characterize it as self-productive. Um, and that's, I mean, I think you can hear that in a temporal way. I'm not sure that it has to be heard in a temporal way, but, but you're quite right. That's, um, I think the temporal terminology should not be employed in the first instance to characterize the unity. I think, in fact, that's extremely important not to do it that way. Um, the, um, the other question, unity of concept, unity of judgment, um, I'm not um, thinking of concepts and judgments as so radically distinct from one another as we commonly do in the, you know, in the last hundred years. Or so. Um, uh, so I think in my, it, as it, it may have come out in the, in the account I gave of, of um, synthetic judgment. Um, we start from a concept. It's enlarged. In that, in that communication, and the result, what we speak of, is a, a concept. We, we unite, the, we unite the, um, the representations into the concept of an object. So it's it's, um, it's a it's a kind of view of the, of, the, of, the, of the growth of discursive cognition on which um, something from without is introduced, brought into the self-agreement or self-agreeing you know, positive unity of the, of the cognition um, and that structure is preserved across that incorporation. So um, I, I, I'm, in this paper I'm not thinking too much about the difference between a concept in maybe a precise sense of the over against the judgment. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I thought. I just wanted yeah. to be clear about it because you're, you're... So you're okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Thomas? Thanks. Yeah, I, um, I have a question about the relation between the Copernican approach and transcendental idealism. And you mentioned this very briefly in your introductory remarks. There's yeah. this kind of intriguing footnote, um, I think number 26. Right. Um, <laughs> on page 20, where you say that um, we can see that the Copernican way of thinking issues in a generic form of transcendental or formal idealism. Um, and 
we then flesh that out in terms of dependence um, of the object and knowledge with respect to form but not existence um, and yeah, that, that, seems, that seems good um, fine. The, what I wonder is and this is just a genuine question I mean th- this, would, this would suggest that there's dependence with regard to form here both with regard to the sensible aspect of the form and with regard to the intellectual or conceptual aspect of it. Um, and in, with regard, in, in both of these respects, um, the objects of knowledge are appearances rather than things as they are in themselves. Kant seems to associate transcendental idealism usually specifically with with the status of you know the sensible right. aspect of this. Right. Um, and he never really says Know that well because the intellectual form of an, an object is in the relevant sense mind dependent as well or something but that already gives us a notion of transcendental idealism so um, how, how do you think about this I mean uh, well yeah I I, uh, I Notice I didn't really get into the sensible um, um, the, um, the sensible the the, 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 um, the way in which the um, Kant's account of our sensibility <coughs> figures in his doctrine of transcendental idealism. I, I, I sort of don't go to that level. I'm trying to just to think about theoretical knowledge in a general way and. Uh, understand the Copernican revolution, revolution or revolution um, um, just by that level of reflection. I think that you, I, I think that you probably, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I have not worked this all out, but I, I'm, I'm ready to, to think. I do think that um, working, you know, if, if you try to work out what um, a sensibility is going to have to, how it's going to have to be constituted in a subject that has a discursive theoretical capacity to know, um, there are going to need to be something like forms, sensibility, through which the act of um, the spontaneous activity the understanding and figure in the immediate apprehension of an object of sense, a sensible appearance. Um, so, um, although it may sound as though I'm trying to have my Copernican way of thinking without having to get into the full doctrine of transcendentalism, I'm not meaning to say that that's not going to be part of the, what will need to be included as part of the complete account. I'm just sort of not going into that here. I mean, so may- maybe, um, my, my question sort of concerns in a way the, the other half of it. I mean, the way you're making it sound, it sounds as if the discursivity of our minds entails transcendental idealism. Um, yet Kant doesn't seem to say that as far as I'm aware. In fact, he seems to you discuss transcendental idealism only in connection with some more, much more specific, some some much more specific kinds of ideas about sensibility of its form, or yeah. put differently, the metaphysical you know, character of space and time. Yeah. So, well, it's just, it's, I mean, you know, may, may, maybe maybe he maybe he is committed to what I just said about the the move from discursivity to to transcendental idealism, and just should have said that it didn't. I suppose, but it's just like the so prima facie. It seems like well, that that's not where he locates yeah. ideality. Um, okay, so that, I think that helps. I, I have a better idea of what you're 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 asking about, and and, and you're quite right. It does. Um, I think it's many readers have not unreasonably um, surmised that. The doctrine of transcendental idealism has a special relation to Kant's view of human sensibility, 
and it can, I think, seem as though that's a special feature of the way he thinks about sensibility that's maybe independent, swings free from his account of the understanding. But I don't think that's the way he's viewing things. Um, um, when we you know, turn to the opening of the Transcendental Aesthetic, we find after the initial characterization of intuition um, uh, and a few comments about sensation and, and appearance, um, he then, in a short little stretch, argues, in effect, that there's going to have to be a form. Right? Long before, well, a few pages before we hear any mention of space or time. Um, where is that coming from? How does he think he knows there's going to be a form of sensibility? I think he thinks he knows it because he supposes that unless there is such a form, we'll never understand how there can be synthetic a priori knowledge of theoretical knowledge of objects. Um, that exist, that, you know, that, that must be given from elsewhere in order for us to know them. They're there anyway. Our first encounter of them is going to be through their being given to us by affecting our senses. And if there isn't some form in which that sensible representation of them is um, 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 specific to that sensible characterization of them, um, Which you know, say this that will have some relation to the understanding. Um, then there will, then there will be no way of understanding how the um, the intellectual representations um, um, attach to the objects originally sensibly represented in a way that um, uh, doesn't come on the scene too late. Um, that's, I think. That's why we have to have forms of sensibility if we have theoretical uh, theoretical cognitive capacity, which is also a capacity for a priori cognition. So um, it's only once that argument is set out that we're then in a position to recognize our old friend space and time as just the sort of thing that counts as a form of sensibility. So we already know before we rummaged around in sensibility and discovered, oh, look at this, we happen to have space and time um, as, as modes of sensible representation. Before that's happened, he's already got in place the idea of um, a sensibility um, that represents in accordance with form or form. So um, that's in a way filling out why I think that the account I'm offering here is going to eventually need to include um, some um, account of form of sensibility as well. Yeah, I mean, this is Thomas's question. Still a version of it, but well, let me put it a slightly different way. Oh. Um, you know, a lot of commentators, or a certain number of commentators, it seems to me, treat whatever's being said in the Copernican rhetoric, if they try to summarize it, and treat what's being said in the statement of transcendental idealism. So that it just looks like they amount to the same thought. It just looks like interchangeable rhetoric for the same point. Um, and there might be a question about how would each of those things say is related to each other, which I take it to be an issue. Right in the conversation between you and Thomas, but I took an attractive feature of your paper to be, which I'm kind of hoping you're not retracting in your answer to Thomas, um, that um, that's a mistake, that feature of commentators. So um, one thought that was very attractive about your spelling out of what the right way to understand the Copernican rhetoric is, um, I mean, I think my favorite sentence in this regard, I'll just read it out. <laughs> Everyone, where are we? Anyone hasn't read the paper will want to know. Page 16, um, end of the paragraph, it's on page. You say, you're, you're talking about, um, talk about um, Kant's striking language of the legislation, legislation, which I take it 
to be the kind of language which is the epitome of the Copernican Rev. This is the Copernican Rev. Um, um, as this characterization makes explicit, the legislative relation knowledge bears to its object holds fundamentally at the level of capacity. Between the understanding of capacity and knowledge, nature, the knowability of things. So part of what you're insisting on is we need to we need to move to the formal level um, to see where the truth in the Copernican rather is. And part of what goes wrong in the diagnosis you give at the end is the wrong kind of focusing of the matter thing that leads to the reversal of the relation. So it looks like the matter is impressing the form. Actually, the knower. Um, leave me that aside. But but so what you're saying here is that. Um, it holds fun with the level of capacity, and your initial specification of this is between the understanding and nature. So getting something straight about how we need to conceive of the capacity of the understanding with regard to its form will allow us to see what the Copernican rhetoric is saying. So our topic here is not sensibility. It's true this is part of the story in which the capacity has to be actualized, and that's going to require that the form stay in relation to a matter. And it's true that sensibility, uh, sorry, understanding is going to be idle and useless, you know, apart from relation to sensibility. So, and so, so it's clearly a story in which um, sensibility will come into play, and if sensibility comes into play, um, certain considerations will bring us to see perhaps, this is, I take it, part of your answer. It's almost that sensibility must have a form, and further considerations will lead us to say that once we try to characterize that form, um, we can further see <laughs> another step that um, perhaps space and time are the right characterizations of that form. But if the seed of transcendental idealism as a thought comes, you know, with you know a series of thoughts that involve, you know clarity about the relationship of the form of the understanding with respect to its matter, matter that transcendental idealism as a doctrine attaches to a different point in exactly, the overall exactly, account exactly, than exactly, the Copernican exactly, thought initially. Exactly. That's sort of downstream from the Copernican idea. That's right. right. That's right. And, 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 um, and I think you need to address the Copernican and, and you weren't taking that back first, or that footnote. By no means. Yeah. No, that's right. Which I think was, the footnote could make it seem like you're pulling them closer together. Yeah. I wanted to hear you uh, saying, well, no, no, I'm not doing that in that footnote. I didn't mean that at all. No. Um, it's the reference to generic transcendental ideas. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it sound like you're already at transcendental. But I take yeah. it what you meant by generic transcendental idealism was not what you're saying on page 16, the passage I read out about the capacity of the understanding in its relation to nature, but something like a generic reflection with regard to the form of sensibility as such um, already could bring in the idea of transcendental idealism. So it's still generic at that level. Um, but, um, it's not turning on some thought about specific formatives of our sensibility, but it's still downstream from the Copernican thought. Is, is, that, is that right? I mean, it's partly a question about what the generic means in, in uh, right. 16. Um, yeah, I'm... Uh, I think you raise a good question. I want to think about that a little more. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure myself now what, um, what the best thing to say is here. Um, for, for sure, um, um, there's a. I mean, I, I'm hesitating in in part because I'm not sure I understand what transcendental idealism is. Um, in part because I'm not sure I understand what idealism is in terms of understanding. Um, I That's interesting because mm -hmm. many people use the Copernican rhetoric to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe that's maybe a, a, a deeper, darker question, and I, I won't pursue it, but um, if we just um, um, take, take the um, things that Kant says about the um, about idealism, 
then it, 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 it seems, I think, at least for one reading of the phrase, fair to interpret it as specifically concerned with the forms of, or arising from his doctrine of the forms of our sensible intuition. And so there's a way of reading personal idealism, perhaps the best way to read it, which um, would have it placed where you were suggesting. Um, but there's some, there are some dark matters um, in the background that um, I don't understand very well, and I'm kind of, sorry, I'm not, I'm a little hesitant, but I'm not sure what, what. And you have a reference to B519 and yeah, yeah, where he talks about formal idealism. Oh, yeah, formal idealism is um, yeah a, a way of putting it that I find a little maybe preferable because it focuses on the form as opposed to the matter, and that's that fits with the way I've been putting it. So, so that's um, maybe we can speak of a kind of a formal idealism. But, um, <laughs> but I was still suggesting it's fitting with isn't the same thing. Isn't it being the same thing as it? But it's something that. In another downstream from the community. Right. right. I mean, here again, I'm having difficulty. I'm not sure what idealism. <coughs> um, but but I, 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 I know I know I understand your concern, and I and um, I, I mean to respect it, and whatever I figure out <laughs> I want to say. But I, um, um, these same. Um, I mean, the same, the same um, understanding, or the same intellect, using the same basic concepts, working with the same basic capacity. Sorry, um, the, the same, the same power of you, you, you giving unity to the representations will have an employment in practical, um, um, in practical matters, in practical knowing. Uh, where there won't be any talk on cause part of idealism whatsoever. So we don't want to think of, um, at least in one important sense, we don't want to think of idealism as being brought into the picture just by the use of um, of the um, discursive cognitive power. Does that you don't, you don't look happy well, but I would have thought, I mean, the topic of the sentence on page 16 I read out, which I like, is tied to the theoretical yes. employment of reason. And it's only there where, um, you know, there is this dependence on the actuality of the object, the actuality of representation, that we then need to make the Copernican point about, at the level of capacity, um, the point you want to make about the direction in which conformity goes. Kind of, you know, contrary to traditional philosophical thought, but I was still wanting. I misspoke. You were you. But um, but I was still thinking. Yay, interesting. But this suggests an understanding of the Copernican rhetoric, in which we need to hold it apart from the doctrine of transcendental idealism, if that's tethered to a point you know that has to do with the details of the aesthetic. This is consistent, of course, with your saying that these commitments, you know, are related to each other in a certain kind of way. It's not right. that. Um, and um, in Kant, I mean, I'm not, but but still, they're they're you know, they're shorthand for a point that can come out of reflection on the very idea of um, the formal aspect of our intellectual cognitive capacity, or the intellectual aspect of our cognitive capacity. In the one case, in the other case. It's materialization, you know, relation to sensibility, and so they're going to have they're going to figure in different moments in the story. And then the the worrisome thing about that footnote, depending upon how it was supposed to be read, is that it seems to maybe be sort of going back to the old idea that no, we should just take these to be two ways of saying the same thing. And I was, I was trying to um, quote them back hard again, and um, and different things you say. Are, are seem to be leaning in both the, in one direction or the other. And so I'm still checking in about where you are about this. Well, maybe I um, maybe I should reconsider whether to um, retain the, or reconsider that footnote. Right. Um, 
I certainly um, don't. Think of the kind of um, uh, relation that the objects known theoretically have to the theoretical cognizing power to be um, according to what's been set out here. Um, I don't think of them those those objects as. As yet. Well, I don't. I, I, maybe, maybe, um, maybe if we just um, <coughs> how about this? Is this is this, is this okay? Um, the, um, the, um, the Copernican account that I've been trying to sketch out here um, brings with it some relation to transcendental idealism. Something, something like that. Um, some, there'll be some um, um, but that's Um, on account of the need to work out the complete um, 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 completely articulate the, the, involved, the involvement of the two capacities that discursive cognition um, relies on. And, and in, the, um, in the working out of the on account of the sensible um, capacity um, a doctrine kindred to what Conan calls transcendental idealism will be um, can be anticipated you can see that there's going to be something like that is that yeah okay? that's what right. I want because okay. I want the possibility yeah. I mean the reason that's, it's, that's it's that's not just terminology I think is I want the possibility that properly understood someone could completely buy the thought in your way of spelling out the Copernican thought of the passage I read out on page 16 and not like the details of the doctrine of sensibility and therefore dig in in the way that's been worked out and I would have thought that is actually a pretty good description of the Kant-Hegel relationship among other things um, oh, so um so pulling these things apart, you know, could be important, you know, for understanding, you know, various, you know, conversations that post Kantians are having with Kant that will be hard to understand. If one doesn't, if one can't pull them. That could well be. Like, um, yeah. So that's part of what's in the back of my mind in, in thinking that this is very helpful because, um, as you do here, I think, I think the way you fleshed out the Copernican thought looks like. Um, it um, remains the fundamental thought of German ideals or something like that, so he's called it out. Um, um, and yet, um, something about Kant's transcendental ideals <coughs> is also sort of obviously whatever the details of the story is something that bugs <laughs> the subsequent German ideals. And that could just, yeah. you know, seem very puzzling um, if one thinks that Copernicanism and, 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 and transcendental idealism are somehow two ways of stating the same thing. And so yes. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, that so it may well be a very valuable um, articulation of the two components to Kant's larger kind of discursive theoretical cognition, um, keeping um, considerations that give us a Copernican way of thinking um, um, separate from the account of human sensibility. Uh, one of the reasons I think why um, I focused on the one rather than the other is because it seemed to me to be more basic, but also I find it a little easier to think about. So um, that's the next thing. That is what's in, what's implied by this in respect of the, uh, the 
um, sensible powers must cooperate with the, um, the spontaneous source of power. Robert, did you still have no, uh, a follow-up on this? No. Then we turn to the next person with a question. That's you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on the on the central claim about why Kant, given why Kant at the deepest level would have thought we should now entertain the possibility that objects should conform to our knowledge rather than the other way around, I think I, I agree with everything you say. Um, that this, to understand this, we have to understand something deep about what Kant thought theoretical knowledge was. The most important thing to understand is that it's self-constituting and self-productive, something that follows from the, in the way Kant sees it, from the self-conscious character of judgment. Um, and this, this gives us a way of understanding why he thinks knowledge is dependent on objects but not constituted by them, but constituted by itself. Oh, that seems to me completely compelling. What I have a question about is your comment in the very beginning about strangeness. Uh, the two things you say, that we should find the claim strange, and we should even find it strange that Kant doesn't find it strange. So the question is... Well, if we find it strange, that we find it That we find it strange, sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I get my dialectical levels confused. Um, but at the, in the beginning of the paragraph, here's a, here's a way of thinking, Kant wouldn't find it strange, we shouldn't find it strange. At the beginning of the paragraph, the famous paragraph where he talks about conforming to knowledge, he says why he doesn't think it's strange. He says, given the very great changes that have occurred in mathematics and natural science, it's now time for us to try to do what they did. And he means, of course, Newton means that the idea of objects conforming to knowledge is perfectly intelligible on the notion of a mathematical construction of the mathematizable properties of nature, and then an inquiry to see if objects conform to them. We then know what experiments to, co to construct, what observations are important. We're making objects, we're putting nature to the test by making them conform. So that seems to be the model. And then if, if that is a parallel kind of enterprise in the critical philosophy, and we do determine that it's a synthetic a priori truth that every event has a cause, then what we're looking for in empirical knowledge um, is in a way seeing whether the objects conform to that condition of knowledge. In other words, if we have a succession of representations in which it's not possible to distinguish subjective succession from objective succession, we don't have enough evidence, for that, then, then the objects don't conform to the conditions of knowledge. We can't say what causes what. We can't say why did A occur, because B occurs, because there's not enough in what we get to conform to the conditions of knowledge. So far from it even being close to idealism, I mean, nobody, nobody would really think Newton, I mean, he's got these crazy views about God, but nobody really thinks of just Newtonian science itself as entailing idealism. I mean, it's still the case that there's empirical knowledge, confirmability, disprovability, and so forth. Why wouldn't that structure be, at least now, the, the next step to, given that Kant thinks thinking is discursive and can provide itself with no content, it might be the case that for other considerations, he might think that in order for there to be content for thought, something about the deliverances of sensibility occurs in a way that we can only say is true of finite rational beings like us, or something like that. That might be true. But if you think of it all in the non-strange way just summarized, there wouldn't be any, just in that, any temptation to idealism. It would just be, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that in order to prove there is synthetic a priori knowledge, we might have to do some things that touch on the issue of idealism, but the model wouldn't be strange. I think I, I agree that the model wouldn't strike, would, be, would not strike, the Kant would not think that the model would strike his readers as strange, and I think it's fair to say that it probably wouldn't strike them as strange. It's, um, um, uh, I mean, there, there, there was a, I don't know this history well, but I mean, there was I think there were a number of modern philosophers who um, took seriously the idea of what was called major's knowledge, um, the kind of knowledge that productive... Um, Kant says reason about, only knows um, what it makes. Yeah, the, the, the engineer's knowledge of the machine um, as a kind of model for, for, um, for science, mm -hmm. in fact. And so uh, viewed, in that, viewed in that context, um, Kant is, I think... Um, Offer. I mean, he's sort of. Ex I think extending um, a familiar. I mean, he's really. He's really. Um, start. I mean, com comparing theoretical knowing in general with 
this kind of productive knowing that um, is served as a model for physical understanding of nature in the modern period. Um, I think that, you know, in philosophy, there's been a long tradition, there was a, in Kant's day, a long tradition of distinguishing between productive knowing and straight theoretical knowing. And he's sort of taking a step to think of all theoretical knowing as bearing a kind of analogy to productive knowing that I think is a stronger analogy than the philosophical tradition tended to. Well, that's, yeah, exactly. That's, 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 that's the real that's Copernican. That's strange thing. Right? That's the real exactly. Copernican revolution. Right. Thinking is not a kind of perceiving at all. <coughs> Locke sensualized exactly. the understanding. Leibniz exactly. intellectualized exactly. the sensibility. That's the that's exactly. the break in the There's history of no philosophy. Apprehensive power. The, he's not just suggesting. Right. He knows how revolutionary that is, right. and it's what leads to all the other. But he does think of it on the model of natural science that reason constructs for itself yes. the mathematizable yeah. nature yes. and then investigates what objects conform to it. Yeah. So perhaps um, for someone who's well-versed in the facts of the sciences and how hypotheses get framed, it wouldn't seem as no, surprising. But in the context of philosophy, it might be. Yeah. Among metaphysicians, it might be. They're, they're a little behind the times. <laughs> I I, I'm not sure, but he, he does, he does say, you know, in, in places that it, it's um, contrary to the senses. That I think he recognizes that it's going to sound surprising to me. He thinks the whole tradition of metaphysics thinks the other way around. Exactly. So clearly, right. 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 It's, it's, it's clearly him what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> There's a moment in your paper that I liked. It's not coming out in your answer to Robert right now, but it seems like it belongs to the answer to the Robert. I mean, uh, it's so so it's, it's, um, the moment I'm thinking about is when you say um, on page 22, as we're moving into your conclusion, a more insidious and potent factor is that when subjects of theoretical knowledge attempt to turn their attention on such knowledge. Um, so, um, so, I mean, Robert's emphasizing, yeah. and there might be a truth to it, is that given a certain kind of clarity that might now be possible in reflection about what scientific inquiry really is, we have a sort of picture of how science starts with an idealization. Only given that idealization, um, you know, is, is you know, Galileo's law, a law, and so forth. Um, um, and that might be right that in some sort of you know understanding of what science is, if it properly understands itself, we have a certain picture of what we might call the productive moment, even in theoretical knowledge, which causes, which will force us to put the, the traditional contrast between theoretical and practical knowledge more carefully than one used to. But, um, but, um, but there are people, you know, I take it the best example here is somebody like Hume, who says, you know, what he wants to be is a Newton of the mind, you know. And so um, he thinks himself as carrying on the scientific revolution, but now turning it to philosophy. And, um, and I take it the thought here, which is part of the diagnosis of, of why... Um, the truth in the Copernican thought is hard to think for philosophers. If I understood your story, at least at that moment, diagnosis, it's actually become harder to harder, think exactly, the exactly. scientific exactly. revolution, yeah. not easier. That you know, it was a lot easier for an Aristotelian to sort of, you know, um, take the mind and its activity to be, for lack of a better phrase, I'll just say something you understand from the inside. You know, you understand. It, the capacity you're trying to understand, the capacity you're exercising trying to understand it, are one of the same capacities, kind of a fundamental Aristotelian thought. But there's this sort of picture in the early modern period. There's something which is called the method of the natural sciences, where we step back and we look at how stuff works. And that's the method we want to apply to understand theoretical cognition. And that when Hume does that, a certain moment of self-alienation sets in, in which, um, which makes the thought that underlies your unpacking of the Copernican rhetoric no longer accessible <laughs> um, because um, because because that really that the truth that's captured um, in those sentences about um, um, what's right about the Copernican way of thinking really has to do with our understanding of the capacity from the inside. Um, yeah. Um, and in and, 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 and that respect, um, even a very careful philosophical reflection about a certain aspect of idealization in modern physics, you know, could be pulled out as something <coughs> which we can see, you know, fits a thought in the Copernican rhetoric. That'd be consistent with thinking the net effect of the rise of the scientific revolution has actually been to make 
this thought that comes after here harder for philosophers on the whole when they philosophize about the nature of theoretical reason to grasp than, than easier. I thought something yeah, like that no, was an idea in your paper. That is, that is there, although um, I'll just add one thing to it. Um, I mean, Hume is a special, kind of a special case yeah, because of the way in which he sort of stays inside the mind and just makes the mind the kind of theories. Uh, right. Um, but there is some the picture of, of method in which a, was a counting similar, was there. Or something. similar kind of, I think, philosophers will make a move in a similar spirit of yes. without trying to be a mental geographer yes. and in which they will yes. um, take this um, yeah. um, as John um, <coughs> and, and the and the and think of them both as objects of theory and things to be known and, and you get into um, a position where it's very hard to see how Ferguson was thinking really viable, even though if there's anything to this account, that's where you started before you became a philosopher who was disposed to understand things theoretically across the board. Mark, you had a just, just a follow-up. One. I, mean, I, I, I just thought these were two different aspects of right. the scientific revolution you're talking about. They don't the, 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 the move to the sideways on picture and they point in the one direction, but I took it that Robert's point was paradigmatically something like inventing the calculus, which is a complex, lots of moving parts structure one has to literally invent in order to be able to so much as intelligibly say the kinds of things you want to test as empirical hypotheses, right? Yeah. And, and also, I, I th- actually, just as a small point, that the engineering model is actually really important for the calculus at that point, which was straight out inconsistent. Uh, Barclay points this out to Newton, and Newton says, yeah, yeah, I know that's a problem, that sort of sucks, but I know how to use it. I, I know when I can treat these differentials as zero and when I can treat them as not zero, and it, and it look, it works. So there's, there's, a, there's practical mastery very much in Newton's own self-conception of how he's using it. It takes a hundred years before anyone can quit that. And, and right, so, so that, but that, then they cut in very different directions, the two. Totally yeah. but, but it's still important, I think, for this story that one, despite what Robert said and the truth it contains, yeah. that one could make sense of why, in the wake <coughs> of the scientific revolution, yeah. revolution <coughs> the way of thinking about the matter, the kind that was important philosophically, um, has become more, less and less accessible. Sure, depends <laughs> okay. on which bit you're paying attention. So the common understanding, understanding among philosophers in the yeah. light of this revolution hasn't latched on Robert's thought, but it's right. distracted by something. Yeah. His thoughts are good. Follow up. Well, it's on the Copernican revolution. Follow up. I don't know how to individual. Oh, you also yeah. have a yeah. maybe question. follow up. I think well, I, I think, think his hand was up first. Yeah. Okay. Well, this isn't going to be very clear, but it it might run mm-hmm. against what Jim was saying he likes about separating the Copernican notion from trans. So when he says, let's make trial whether knowledge, the object conforming to our knowledge, but then he says this is really, I'm treating it as hypothetical or front-loaded as it were, but it's really demonstrated in the work. And then some of the way you would this is more about the sort of field that comes out from here is that reflection on by reason on itself in in knowing an object or a reality that's independent of it will generate the distinctions that are that are involved in the thing and then even in the aesthetic you wanted it to be before you get to this stuff about space and time it's really already there so but another way to look at it is a lot of the way you describe it might fit reason's own traditional project. If you look at the dialectic and, and reason's self-productive character, and it's finite reason, but it's got there should be logical considerations that are sufficient for any conclusions, and it's to be adequate to a reality that's independent of it as well. And so you, it just so happens that when you go through the actual book three things happen you know the third one is reason implodes when it tries to do that thing when it in its in its self-positing self-productive way assumes adequacy to an object that's independent of it you it leads to antinomies 
this is something you discover in the work. But similarly for the other two things, that you discover that there are forms of sensibility that are not derived from the object. And then similarly, you discover that thinking involves certain forms that have a sort of essential dependence on synthesizing the thing you discovered in the first part of the book. So it just seems more to me that the Copernican revolution in spirit, when it's described, is there's going to be forms of intuition. There's going to be forms of understanding. These are things you discover. And that makes a big difference, I think. And it, and it relates it more to transcendental idealism in an intelligible way because the thing in itself is what reason would have been adequate to in its self-productive character and knowing a reality independent of it if we hadn't made this trial through through the book. It turns out that, that that's the idea of a thing in itself. Uh, and the contrast with it is what you discover in discovering that really the object is constrained by these two different kinds of forms. So it, it just looked like the Copernican revolution was self-generating. It may fit with the Hegel tradition that came after it to think of it as self-generating from the very idea of reason's own self-productive cognition of a reality independent of it, but it's really the trial of the book that, that's needed to understand what the, the grounds for the Copernican revolution is, not just reason's self-reflection on its um, I think I read the book somewhat differently. Um, um, there, there is this long you know, slog through the um, inferences of um, traditional metaphysics uh, for reason um, uh, in its ostensible pure use. Uh, but at the end of that, the very end, I think it, it's just one of the last things he says uh, is that, um, um, in fact, all of these dialectical inferences of reason um, we could foresee would lead to nothing. Um, that is back in the analytic. We already knew that this wasn't going to work. Um, um, it, were it not for the this illusion, which he thinks of as endemic to reason in the human subject, um, were it not for that illusion, which constantly incites the philosopher to speculate, um, um, or, sorry, it's, it's on account of that illusion that it's necessary for um, the critique of pure reason, notwithstanding that the outcome was foreseeable, uh, to go through all of the dialectical inferences and systematically expose the, uh, the way in which the illusion um, um, is at work and the, and the emptiness of the, of, the, of, the, of the arguments. So, um, I think of the... Um, the um, um, the, initial, the initial pre-critical um, deportment of reason or, or inclination of reason as uh, somewhat un sort of lacking a certain kind of discipline, um, self-discipline, and uh, because of the illusion that has to do with its relation to human condition, and and so. Um, on account of that, um, I'm inclined to think that Kant um, would um, suppose <coughs> it's possible, as I'm inclined to think, to work out from an understanding of what theoretical cognition is in a very primitive case, not high science, but just ordinary theoretical knowing, um, what the conditions are um, so far as they reside in our cognitive capacity to, to understand that philosophically and um, I don't think of this as involving any discoveries as you put it I, I mean, although I understand how it can seem as though Kant's discovering the forms of 
thinking and discovering the forms of sensibility, space, and time, yeah. that these are in some sense what? Uh, yeah, um, empiric, is this a kind of empirical, no. um, or what, 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 maybe you didn't mean that when you said discover, but, um, um, it's I just differently, plays a different role than being discovered in the very idea of reason having knowledge of another, that you do have to, anyway. But isn't there a difference between analytic and dialogue? I mean, Con I mean, I take it this is maybe a way of putting what you were thinking. I mean, I mean, Kant says pure general logic has an analytic and a dialectic. If they take it or model on something like you know Aristotle's prior analytics and the sophistical refutation. So I mean, Aristotle's coming up with syllogisms is not, in one sense, discovering something. It's sort of from within our logical capacities, you know, achieving a certain reflexive self-consciousness on what the form of our logical thought is. The statistical reputation, sort of seeing how it is that this argument of a sophist or that argument of a sophist seems compelling when it's not, is another thing you can do, you know, once you have um, an analytic. But it's a rather different kind of task. And I would have thought, you know, very crudely, the transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic stand that way to each other. And it seemed like you were trying to tell a story in which now the way things happen in the transcendental analytic can be understood to be continuous, you know, and something like its principle with the way things come to light in the transcendental dialectic. Yeah, and dialectics addresses the difficulties that human reason calls into because of its misemployment, but in order to be able to address those difficulties properly, we have to, first of all, um, set out a canon for the use of reason, and that's what the analytic provides. Um, so we're doing transcendental logic on the anal on, on analogy with general logic in the, anal in the analytic um, um, in the um, in, in the service of spelling out um, a standard for correct use, and that is what I um, I think of as the proper business of the first business of philosophy, and um, it, it, it's I think it's to be developed from self consciousness of the activity that's for which the standard is pertinent, to which is pertinent. That's yeah. yeah, and it's certainly not a... I didn't mean to say it's a process of the kind of discovering as it goes along or anything like that. It would just... Uh, it was more like the, the arguments that are given in the aesthetic and in the analytic are arguments that are crucial on their own grounds for understanding why you need a capacity of just this kind, this form in the case of space and time, and why it's not contributed by the object. And then again, the same thing in the case of the understanding. And whereas it, it just looks more like, just from the sheer idea of reason's self-active theoretical knowledge, you essentially get that without any additional... <coughs> basic premises or arguments, whereas uh, I think there's another strain in Kant, which is why do we have just these forms of sensibility, these finite ways of thinking, and, and then why does what happened to reason happen to reason? That, that just means you, you it, it's not a discovery, but it's that there's independent grounds for each of those things, that then when you write the preface, it looks like you're just generating maybe from the sheer idea of reason's theoretical knowledge that, it, that this is going to be the case, forms of intuition and forms of con consciousness. But, but anyway, that's it. Yeah. Can I call you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a complete amateur here, but um, in terms of the strangeness or non-strangeness, um, as you came up, and simple-mindedly, it's always seemed to me that there's a very compelling reason for the Copernican term. And it's the Kant draws in a much clearer way than Locke or Hume or certainly any of the empiricists do the distinction between quid juris and quid facti I mean, so the trouble with, 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 with Locke and company is they think that quote the science of the mind is a kind of straightforward empirical investigation but if the question is our right to as it were use the concepts that we do to think about the world and if the objects of the world are just, are so to say, mere things in themselves, they are what they are in ways that have no necessary connection with any formal conditions that belong to the very possibility of representing an object, 
then there is no answer to the question quid juris I mean absolutely not um, we'd have to as John says see things from sideways on or there'd have to be as it were a non-conceptual constraint on knowing an object conceptually all those things would have to follow um, so if if you even think the question quid juris is, is, is legitimate in a way at the level of generality but which Kant means to ask it then there is no alternative to the Copernican term I mean abs- absolutely none um, and this is just was always just my simple minded way of thinking about it but um, I think that argument has a, a certain compelling force and, and it's, you asked about Sellers it, it, it's really reflected certain <coughs> way of reading Sellers attack on the myth of the given for example that you know one one simply could not understand empirical knowledge at all uh, in, in, in terms of objects being quote whatever that would be, you know sort of given without themselves having any necessary relation at all to our way of even thinking about the more conceptual argument more representing so so um, and it's no accident that empiricism is the, the historical antecedent of the myth of the gift and the form in which Sellers takes it on, the form in which it's found in, <coughs> in, in, in Schlick and logical empiricism and, 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 and Russell and everyone else. They're, they're, they're just late descendants of, of Locke and Hume in this regard. So I, I was actually... And then it's, it's sort of no accident, really, that the very words, um, uh, Kentner's theory, and, you know... Uh, are post-Kantian words, I mean, because only with Kant is there really a clear understanding of what it is that Locke and Hume were failing to do. This is just Lehrer. I mean, they, they all come up quite soon post-Kant. They're, they're not in the philosophical lexicon, I understand, from this great German philosophical vert- book. So, you know, the, uh, so I, I was surprised that the distinction perhaps between quid juris and quid facti didn't feature more in the uh-huh. initial motivation for them. But anyway, I, look, I, I don't know a thing about this. Okay, so. Maybe just like part the, um, the, 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 the dialectical path I was following, I was trying to start with the ordinary understanding of discursive theoretical knowledge, which needn't um, have an account of the categories. Um, concepts with respect to which Kant raised the quid juris question. You may be meaning in a broader sense than that, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But, um, uh, I, I, I do, I do, I must say though, I do share, I find myself drawn to your, I, I mean, it's hard when you really start to think about the, the other, the pre-Copernican way of thinking about the relation of knowledge to a subject. It is very hard to understand, I mean, how, how it could be um, well there, there seem, it seems to be a, a, a natural thing people are prone to think when they're, when they're, when they're asked the question I mean, that's my sense I mean, you know, Sprawson seems to register that, that point of view on things um, but when I try to think what, um, what, could, what could someone be thinking when they um, say that our knowledge must conform to the object um, what, on what basis do they think they know a thing like that? Um, the, the, the floor is kind of receives <laughs> falls out. I'm wondering. I don't. <laughs> what do you? Uh, there's just it seems to me an un, unsupported presumption. That I think I, I mean, the diagnosis was meant to try to give an account of how the presumption could come to be come into place. But I, I, I I'm with you when you really try to think through what what the presumption. Means it, 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 it's not something you can really understand yourself to to know or to. Yeah, I'm so upset with that. Maybe the current way of thinking isn't as strange as I was supposing. Mm-hmm. 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 Not in this crowd, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a representative population. I think, I think my great watered watch. down with the Copernican revolution, yes, to make it a lot easier. I mean, there, there's some thought we could put like this, which would go with the rejection of the method of given. We need concepts. <laughs> you know, without concepts, we're not going to be able to cognize things as particulars. Um, um, and the concepts come from us. So you could think that's the Copernican idea. You know, we, we need to contribute some norms and forms. Um, 
Strassen would be totally happy with that thought. Um, um, but um, Strassen's puzzled by the thing that Steve's trying to explain in his paper. And the, the, I take it, you know, the thing I was reading out from page 16 is, is not... Um, it's not summarizable it, with that kind of watered down idea of the Copernican revolution. Here, the idea has got to be something like, no, but there's a direction of conformity that runs the opposite way from what the traditional philosopher thinks. Why is that? Because it's not just that we need some concepts or other, but what is to have concepts? Well, it's going to turn out to be something about, as it were, clarification. What is to have concepts at all, such that yeah. Any set of concepts are going to turn out to have to. No, I understand that, Jim. But I mean, but, but okay. the failure to distinguish what counts up from empirical psychology goes very deep. So, right. I mean, Stephen emphasizes again and again that in synthesis, as it yields conceptual knowledge, is not mere aggregation. But of course, Hume cannot distinguish predication from mere association of ideas. He can't do it. It exactly has the heat, the heat yeah. feature that Stephen objects to. Well, I mean, but I guess so my point is that what you're, very deep what you're mentioning could be a necessary condition yeah. of getting all the way to what Steve's calling the Copernican well, Revolution. I, but I'm suggesting I, it's not clear it's a sufficient condition. Well, because one can get stuck in the I'm, middle. I'm, Stephen's point about not mere aggregation takes you very, very deep. Because, as I was just saying, I mean, that's precisely what Locke and Hume absolutely cannot account for. And, you know, that's exactly what Green makes his centerpiece of the discussion of the empiricists in, in his famous introduction to Hume, which is really a famous defense of Kant. I mean, <laughs> I mean Hume is a dreadful kind of lesson to us all, you know, what, what the point is. is not a Humean. Yeah, that's my point. I was yeah. using Strasser's no. example and also accept all of your points, mm-hmm. but think the Copernican rhetoric, as Steve's explaining it, goes too far. So, so you might be absolutely right. These are necessary conditions of traveling that route, but they don't just completely unblock it. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, a bit of a frivolous question, but kind of sellers can't question. Hey, is this a follow-up or a no? A new question. Ah, sorry. So sorry. Yeah, follow-up. Daniel. Okay. Oh, I, this is really just an invitation for you to say a bit more about how you conceive of the enlargement, the self-enlargement of a concept in, in determinative synthetic judgment. I mean, you use this word enlargement, you use the word determination, you use the word specification, or sort of incorporation of new content into. And, I mean, there's something that I vaguely grasp about that, but... Um, This notion of growth is supposed to imply both, as you put it, an identity between the presupposed concept and the cognition, the enlarged cognition that results, but also something more. And I'm not quite clear how to think both thoughts together. In particular, I, I mean, I know that when we make a judgment like some cats are tigers, what we're doing is specifying a concept. We're literally specifying a genus. But not all of our synthetic judgments have that form. This tiger is sleeping involves two concepts, neither of which contains the other. So I'm just wondering if you could help me understand this notion of enlarging the concept. Because we're not enlarging it intensely. Are we just enlarging our our understanding of instances in which it can be applied? What's, What's being enlarged there? And oh, well, I would have thought it would be intentionally characterizable. Um, the the um, the, constant, I mean, the the um, the knowledge that constitutes that for the synthetic judgment constitutes um, is is from concepts, and um, I've been interpreting that to mean, at least in part, that. We begin with the concept of the subject, and then we predicate something of it, and he'll say our knowledge is enlarged. Uh, we know more of our subject than we knew going into the judgment. So if you think of the judgment as Kant will sometimes do, uh, as itself constituting a concept, then that concept will contain the subject concept within it, and it will be a subordinate concept, the subject concept. 
Okay, so, so it's that kind of relation that I that I had in mind. So it really is some cats are tigers. I mean, that's that's what all synthetic judgment is like. The the concept that is embodied in the knowledgeable judgment itself is just a species of the genus embodied by the subject concept in that judgment. Is that the view? You can put it that way, yeah. I, I, I think... So that, that's, that's the thought. If by species you mean a subordinate concept. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's the thought. So okay. um, there's a conception of... Um, of um, what a what was your example of a, of a, um, a feline or a cat whatever asleep. sorry that cat is sleep cat cat it will control the act or have in, in stand as form to the um, the um, additional content that's <coughs> introduced through the act of predication. Um, so that what's understood in the act in, in the application of the concept of sleeping, let's say, to um, the subject concept here will be um, that use of the concept will be in accordance with one's understanding of the cat. Mm-hmm. It's a feline so sleeping. Um, it's a cat leaf. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> sleeping. Okay. It's understood in a way that's, that, that agrees with mm. cat, uh-huh. um, mm. um, or maybe you know water <coughs> might be. Uh-huh. This water is ice. Um, ice is understood. Um, uh, the judgment is understood as a um, cognition that is um, in accordance with. Or understanding what water is. That sounds like a determination rather than specification. Yes, and exactly. They, these are all determinations. I think of determination, the concept of determination, <coughs> the concept of specification is something more. Is that, so I, when I determine a concept, I exclude the opposite. Right. Well, I do that when I specify a genus, too. I mean, the species are supposed to be exclusive and exhaustive. Part of what's really surprising about what I, what I take you to be saying now is that um, traditionally a species of a genus is one member of a pair. You get an exclusive and exhaustive differentiation in accordance with a single differentiated mark. And the kind of picture you're spelling out doesn't seem consistent with that understanding of determination or specification of a genus. So I'm wondering what the something more is for you. Or maybe it is consistent. I I wasn't seeing the inconsistency. Um, Well, it certainly seems inconsistent if, if we take there to be a highest genus and somehow a privileged way of dividing that up because then it just doesn't seem like sleeping cat is going to be a proper species, a proper way of dividing the genus cat. We'll need to divide the genus cat in some other way to you know, preserve the distinction between yeah, tigers and yeah. lions. Um, I was a little worried about going with the word species, I think it, species and carries more, more, um, it, it's more, it's a richer notion than I, than I, than I want. Mm-hmm. Um, specification may be um, help, more helpful here, um, um, but it's, um, uh, right, there's going to be a difference between um, predication that attaches, you know, an accident to a subject. Um, and a predication that determines in the sense that um, gives us a more um, complete understanding of the, the thing or its nature. But in both cases, we're enlarging the content of the concept itself? Um,
Now that's sellers. <laughs> that is sellers. But the content of the concept can be enlarged by subsequent discoveries about new forms of judgment. That is sellers. That is just natural time terms, isn't yeah, it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, no concept without law. Yeah. <coughs> I, I'm thinking of acts of judgment, which are cognitions. And although I do speak of concepts here, um, you, I think it gets you can get into trouble because if you think of a concept in abstraction from its use in cognition, then this sort of question arises. But we're talking really about acts of knowing. So I have knowledge of, let's say, um, cat in general. I have knowledge of this cat, and um, I may judge of this cat that it's sleeping. I may judge of cats in general that they're, um, um, well, so these are different ways of predicating and enlarging concepts but um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's it's, it's, um, it's an account that's meant to um, um, pertain to the, 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 um, the, the use of concepts in knowledge mm-hmm. Kant will speak of concepts that he just says Relax about going back and forth between speaking of kindness uh, and the grip. He tends to use concept in the way I'm perhaps um, maybe I shouldn't do it. Um, that, that's crucial, I think. Too. I don't. I don't want to monopolize this. Do you? Okay. Um, Anyone want to follow on me? Well, um, just, um, I mean, Sarah's can't uh, question, but there is a kind of, I mean, in the, and beyond the kind of scope, of, a bit beyond, beyond the scope of this paper, there is a deeper way, one may think, the much deeper way that sensibility and discursivity entangled in, well, this kind of Solerian philosophy, in the sense that um, use of sensible sign, language, is part of the for- discursive form which changes everything, so to speak. You cannot bring it, you cannot do this kind of two-step things. The sensible must observe, so to speak, in the form of thinking, in the discursive form. I wonder what do you think, first of all, whether Kant was, there's any inkling in Kant of this notion, and what difference will it make? Yeah, I wonder about that a little bit. I don't, um, um, I don't have a very good understanding of the issues that are involved here, but um, it does seem as though it's an important feature of Kant's understanding of cognition that um, the science of logic um, that we developed for cognition. Uh, is a science of the rules of the understanding and thinking. It doesn't have um, um, any, I don't see any um, discernible concern with linguistic form, let's say, or something, a form that would be in some way linguistically expressible. Um, that's probably not the best way to put it, but there's, there's a, um, no, no aspiration that I see on Kant's part to develop, say, something like a, you know, a begriff script, something, a con- form of expressing concepts graphically or... Um, yeah, but this um, is deeper. Begriff script is a surface phenomena because it express... Begriff script, I fragging idea of begriff is really just a way of publishing judgment. I mean, the point is, yeah. I mean, in Celestine, you it, it is a thought that kind of discuss, that the sensible belong to the form of judgment, not just to the way it gets published. Uh-huh. Well, that that is a very different view, I think. Um, as I understand Kant, the difference between the act of judgment and sensible representation um, um, This is difficult, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm inclined to say that um, the, the act of sensible representation is understood as um, um, kinetic in character. It 
sense. Um, inner sense is a constant flux of states, sensible representation. Um, whereas judgment is um, constituted um, according to relations that have no temporal or, for that matter, spatial relations whatsoever. Um, there are purely logical relations. Mm, yeah, that doesn't exclude and it. Yeah. yeah, I think so. That's just, I mean, yeah, that, so I don't think that's a relevant. I mean, well, <laughs> in context, the logic to be focused on the act of the understanding, which is um, so. I'm evidently not not understanding the way in which this 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 such a view of of thought. Um, please open the question you're raising. Well, then it's a bad view of thought. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if it, I don't know what you mean, live open. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I mean. I, I mean, there is a. Po- I mean, there is what. Have, let's try to kind of fit your position with the linguistic. What's called the linguistic, the deep linguistic term. So to speak, the idea that the sensible sign belong not belong just the way you publish the judgment, belong to this form of judgment. I mean, and, and, and the kind of judgment can still be an energy, an activity. That doesn't mean that kind of its form does not. Um, so how would sensibility be registered in the form of judgment? Well... Sign is well. That you see what you have to I see what you have to. St- in the fact that it just comes to be. It's not, although it's energetic in character. Um, it's nevertheless, um, it comes to be. No, but what comes to be has to do. I mean, what comes to do come to be is essentially has to do with the capacity to use, for example, logical sign. For example, I mean a sign, material sign, not. Uh, um, set sign, you know, to count negation, number of negation, so to speak. So, Jim's going to explain. I think there's a moment in Kant that's very close to this, but it's interesting that it's a mm-hmm. practical philosophy. I mean, I mean, but I mean, a moment where I think Kant comes close to this kind of view in a different area is, for instance, when he talks about contract. I, mean, I think you'll say, you know, lots of things that are like what you want to say about judgment about a contract. That is, um, the representation of the contract has to have, you know, temporal parts. It has to be the part of the contract that came before, the part of the contract that came after. And in order to represent a contract, we have to part of the party, the first part, party, the second part. It's got to come in some order. The parts of the contract do not exist in the temporal order. They have to, you know, be all at once. And it's this that has to do, I, I think, with the non-applicability of, you know, temporal notions, not with the quickness with which you can... Um, so, um, so there's the numinal contract, if he'll put it. But, um, but Kant also thinks there would be no contract, I think. You know, but for the representation of contracts, you know. So the reality of... Contracts depends that contracts are represented. Um, their representations have temporal parts. That doesn't gainsay the thought that the unity of the parts itself in relation to the whole, which is the contract, is not a temporal one. We have to distinguish between the logic of the expression, the logic of mm-hmm. that which is expressed. But, but you know, what Arad is suggesting, I think, is there are philosophers who have thought that what Kant said about contract was true of thought more generally. <laughs> that is, you know, we aren't going to be able to grasp complicated forms of logical inference or forms of fallacy that involve complicated equivocations and so forth unless, you know, we can control our thought through the expression of thought. But that's not to identify the parts of the judgment with, you know, the things that must, you know, be successive of time in their expression. But nonetheless, the expression of the thought, its outer aspect as expressed, is still a condition of our really being able to manifest these capacities in the ways that we want to to say we do. And then that might have implications then for how form and matter are understood here. I mean, I take it something like that. No, it's deeper, I think. It's well, not about how right. we manifest this capacity. Right. Okay, but I'm, I'm just saying yeah. there's an answering way yeah. you know, here in, yeah. in one aspect of Kant's <coughs> 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure um, what to think about this. I, um, I'm not yet seeing. I mean, certainly, this thought as discursive um, must be communicable. So it must be such as can be communicable. Yeah, yeah that's that are called publishable. Right. Yeah. And this is a, this is a condition of the um, 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 formal condition of discursive cognition. Now, you're, thinking, you're saying this is not what you're talking no, about. No, not the positive no, expression. No, no. So you thought to grasp it's yeah. the form, it only yeah. started to grasp through the medium yeah. of this community. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure what to think on that. I have not thought this, thought about this enough to be able to say. Matt, you had the next question. Mm-hmm. Um. I, I was wondering, uh, as a way of uh, helping me to get a grip on the uh, objects must conform to our cognition idea, if you could set it in contradistinction from some other ideas that seem like they uh, have some of the features, but not all of the features that this idea must involve. I, I mean, so consider the relationship between uh, 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 capacity to sense and a proper sensible or between the capacity for nutrition and food, right? Um, there's a con- conformity or agreement between uh, the capacity and, and the object. Um, the, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not merely a discovery uh, that the capacity for nutrition comes across such things as it can consume um, and in as much as uh, the need for nourishment manifests itself as a state of consciousness hunger um, there's a way I, I think in which uh, you know even if all of my empirical knowledge of nourish, nourishing food were knocked out I would still have an a priori conception of what nourishes right uh, um, uh, I, I, have a, I have a concept of the formal object of the capacity um, just in having the capacity consciously. Um, so, I mean, those are cases of uh, in which, in virtue of a very general fact about the relationship between capacities and their proper objects, um, and in virtue of the fact that the capacity is a conscious capacity, there's a possibility of an a priori knowledge of an aspect of the object. Namely the form. Namely the form. Right. I take it that that fact about the relationship between a conscious capacity and its object wouldn't yet amount to the thought that the object must conform to the act of the capacity. That's right. So could you say That's about right. the further something about the further yeah. requirement I, and what necessitates I, it? I think that the, fur, the further factor um, that we have in the case of cognition that we don't find in these cases, at least as you describe them, um, is the self-determining character of the cognitive capacity. Um, I think it's the self-determination of the act of cognition that precludes our understanding the act as... Um, receiving its form from the object, so it's it's the spontaneity of the of the of capacity exercise that's really really I think the crucial um, feature of it that that requires a Copernican <coughs> order. But do you think that sorry but does the capacity for nourishment receive its form from the the object? Well, um, I mean, actually, I wasn't. I, I, I'm. Um, I don't mean to say that that's the alternative. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's. Um, I think we. Um, the account you describe gives us um, an agreement or something like that, um, if not an identity, between the actualization of the sense capacity and the coming to be sensed of the yeah. sensible thing. Um, 
and I don't I mean I don't mean to take a stand on how 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 the um, how, how how further to understand that that um, that relation of agreement or whatever you want to call it but it's not built into the very idea of um, um, capacity in relation to object that um, it's got to be a Copernican kind of relation I don't think huh. I don't see how that that doesn't seem I don't see how to get that but um, the specification of that general um, account of relation um, that takes account of the the self-determining character of the capacity in the case of cognition does give us a Copernican understanding of that kind of um, um, agreement or relation. That, so, is that, I mean, is that speaking to your question? That's it is. It's, uh, it's helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, partly, I guess, it was driven by the thought that it was in order to explain the possibility of our having an a priori cognition of the object that we were led to the Copernican idea, but now these examples appear to suggest that there can be an a priori cognition of the, of, an, of the object of a capacity where the Copernican relation between the capacity and the object does not apply. So, so well, for the practical theoretical um, well, actually, the, the, the object was the form of cognition, whether we're talking about object theoretical knowledge or object practical knowledge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, Kant famously in the second critique um, describes his method as one that, I mean, paradox in the, the good, the concept of good, which is the concept of knowledge of practical reason, or practical knowledge, as I would put it, um, is determined um, in accordance with principles of practical cognition which reside in representations of an object that's, that's how I interpret it anyway so I think I think that there's there's this the Copernican relation although I'm only speaking of a theoretical case because the theoretical use of reason is in a certain sense basic mm -hmm. um, it covers all all, all applications uh, in material cognition I think. Um, okay I think I think we're out of time. Let's thank our speaker.